You're coming all the way from New Zealand, so it's a bit slow, but it should be all right. <laughs> there we go. Well, at least we've got a satellite. <laughs> Good work. Right, so, yeah, you, you can make full screen or whatever you want, but you can go as well. Uh, well, how are you? How are you seeing it? Are you seeing it uh, full screen or not? Yeah, it is full screen, but you can still make one more. You know, the one that's uh, we're seeing the side slide as well. So, okay, yes, perfect. Right. Uh, last year, I was invited to Swinburne to give a talk from Mohammed about a project we began in 2015 for the 2016 election. It was hoped that that would be a one person, one vote election, uh, but it, as you know, didn't turn out to be that way. So um, we were trying to take the education line of how do you educate people who have lost a whole generation maybe of both education and democracy and even though uh, after Ghana one of the very first um, uh, democracies in Africa uh, as you know we had lost it so I'm going to take about 12-15 minutes and I'm going to skip some of these just to give you the overview so a lot of this is refreshed from last year but, um, you know, what can someone do at the edge of the world with the most isolated country? Mohammed convinced me that the real problem was education in civics or citizenship and how to make it accessible. At first for the MPs and the, uh, you know, over 120, I forget the exact number um, of MPs, but also civil service workers. So uh, I emailed around the country in New Zealand uh, to all the political science departments. And basically I re, um, it took five, six months to write 10 lessons in democracy, but they suggested uh, comparative government and politics, most of them. So I followed um, part of the structure there, but the real problem was to how to make that um, information accessible, especially for people who are semi-literate or didn't have much literate literacy at all. So uh, our mission was to educate the MPs and the civil workers to inform them about parliamentary democracy, but to also say the way parliamentary democracy doesn't work. And Mohammed gave me uh, enough illustrations of how it wasn't working uh, in Somalia or in the third transitional government had been a problem for him when he was an MP there. So uh, on, uh, I touted uh, 10 lessons, I refined them, but basically the 10 lessons we put up after six months on a website, which is still running, called the Somali School of Government. And you can see it here um, under lessons and uh, it was started to be translated. And then it stalled like most of these things from lack of money and lack of people taking them up. But our goal was to translate them into Somali and Arabic and to make it as um, user-friendly as possible. And I aimed at a reading age of 12. Uh, it probably slipped up a bit, uh, but the challenge was uh, when I was presenting in Swinburne to make it much more accessible, um, even with uh, animations and so forth. So that was my challenge to the people at Swinburne who had taken this wonderful, you know, I didn't realize they had a department that was both concerned with the technical aspects of the internet and the facilities possible, but also um, taking a social justice and a, a social work sort of, I forget the name of the department, um, uh, emphasis. So uh, these were the lessons and the first one was introduction to government, second one development of parliaments, et cetera. Um, and you can look at those at another time. But when it got to the, you know, I got to a month into it, I realized I would have to have a history of um, Somalia as well. When people have lost education, they haven't just lost, um, uh, you know, democracy or uh, literacy, but they've also lost a, a number of other things as well. So 10 lessons and uh, ended up with the uh, role of the news media, which is becoming more important in our countries as well, and the rights and responsibilities of those in power, which I tried to make uh, sort of accessible ethics. 
So uh, I'll just run through two or three of these uh, very quickly. The first one was outlining in simple language as I could the knowledge language and attitudes needed to make government work using historical and global examples that were accessible as possible and focusing on the um, features of the system used by 125 um, out of the 196 countries, which are now democracies. And as we know, a lot of these democracies are flawed democracies. Some of them are dysfunctional. I mentioned last year, that I thought the uh, most commentators are saying the US one has become not just flawed, but dysfunctional. Um, but I also pointed out that, uh, you know, this has been a work in progress for Western countries as well. In 1942, there are only 12 democracies, for example. And some have slipped uh, in the Freedom House's uh, gauge of these things. In topic two, the story of the breakthrough ideas that helped uh, build today's parliaments, because I thought that was important. Uh, and when I got into this, I realized it was much more difficult to make accessible. But those are some of the things that um, I tried to do in short paragraphs with subtitles, uh, begging to be animated, but there you go and then charting the breakthrough events that had enabled uh, citizens to contribute to better, fairer societies. Then uh, in topic three and four, I did timelines, development of democracy in topic three. Uh, in topic four, the, uh, and there is another screen about the, uh, the sort of format and the layout I used. Uh, and focusing on, you know, from 1990 in particular, and uh, from the Jasmine Revolution of Tunisia, because it was such a, a groundbreaker in uh, that part of Africa, and uh, you know, others have tried and failed since. Uh, the development of Somalia and the timeline of Somalia, I I found very interesting, and you know, the collapse of uh, late seventies, eighties under the. Uh, sort of socialism and autocracy is well known to people in the West, but um, maybe a lot of MPs didn't. Uh, as an example, last year, I said, look, you know, even uh, in our countries where civics, I'm, I'm battling to get civics uh, taught in the last year, at least, or four years of high school as a compulsory subject. It's compulsory in the UK uh, the word compulsory is a, almost a swear word, like liberal in the US, but um, I've got a couple of slides here further down about um, people starting to call for it now, even in the last week or so. We've got to get it back into K-12, uh, they say, um, for their last year of high school. For it was in the uh, wonderful you know, college system, which was liberal arts, but um, that had become less and less affordable as people lost jobs and uh, the insurance industry sort of took over. So um, I just gave an example last year of, you know, people don't realize there are seven types of majority and that you need, you know, greater 66%. You wanna change the constitution 75, just as an example of um, the sorts of things that even in modern America uh, with 51, 49, people are having trouble with at the moment. Uh, it's not accepted uh, aside from all the security issues, people really don't have that knowledge. This is the well-known, uh, you know, picture of people trying to, you know, Somalis out of uh, territory, uh, trying to use satellite coverage. But again, uh, it's a good image of the power of satellites, but also in a country like uh, Somalia, which is lacking that coverage for the reasons uh, you probably, Peter, outlined before I got on. Is it Peter Longy or Peter Lang? I'm not sure. Lang, yeah. Lang, yeah, we've got a David Longy as a former prime minister. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when I was... Uh, <laughs> when I was teaching in to Bethlehem University, I was teaching um, critical thinking and English there uh, just over two years ago, just under two years ago. Uh, this is um, not happening this week, by the way. This is the blessing of the Christmas tree. Behind us is the mosque, it's a, um, on the West Bank. And uh, this is people who've gone to watch the blessing of the Christmas tree uh, a week ago uh, or last week. 
And you can see, again, um, everyone has got a, a mobile phone. So um, Mohammed said, look, can we make it accessible for people with mobile phones? Because most people uh, in um, Somalia, Somali land in particular, have got uh, mobile phones now, or at least um, some people have. So last year I went to this and uh, the, the conference last year and uh, people gave presentations about connecting the unconnected, Peter, the sort of things that uh, I came in on uh, your excellent talk there. Um, you know, land and fiber submarine even have got problems. It's going to delay even further. But um, I think it was Samata. Um, I just can't remember who. Is it Samata? Ibrahim yes, yes, Mohammed, yes, yeah. he um, suggested, you know, Google had this project Loon using balloons. So uh, that, that was a way in a country like Somalia where it could be affordable and that you could uh, create competition, which as we know um, is suppressed or at least self-suppressed. And um, you don't need to regard them as pirates, but certainly they're a little bit unregulated at the best of times. So um, we decided that um, education was the solution. And, you know, I know from teaching critical thinking, the best, the number one predictor of moral judgment uh, development is education. And it certainly is the key to um, uh, running a functioning democracy. And just a couple of days ago, the um, specialist who got fired by tweet um, in America appeared on Stephen Colbert's A Late Show saying that um, one, the election was the, was the most secure in American history, and uh, he had the backing, he's a specialist in cybersecurity. Two, um, he went on to say something very interesting, that we have to get civic education uh, back on the books in K-12. And he said, probably with uh, adult education as well. So he, he said, look, we've got to have paper ballots. He, he wanted to go back to paper so as a backup. Uh, in case there was this dispute and this kind of paranoia uh, over it. But uh, he wanted the funding, Congress, to fund it properly because it's not funded, the usual story. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, he wanted adults to, you know, to be brought back into uh, high school, secondary, it, uh, last year of secondary at least. When I was teaching in the UK, you know, it is compulsory and has been since 2002. And after the bombing in 2005, they added it a little bit, but civics is compulsory. So um, I decided to go and teach uh, there. And on the way through Hong Kong, um, I saw these you know, reports of these uh, high school students. Uh, they, they're kneeling here, you know, protesting for, um, against the loss of democracy. Uh, so important was it to them, highly educated, and doing it in a measured way, much more measured than the, some of the violent ones. And as I crossed um, to uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, I realized I was going over countries, a lot of them that didn't have uh, the benefit of that. Um, I won't say all the Istans, but certainly uh, there are countries who are more autocratic, perhaps a lot of, you know, it's not just the Philippines, Hungary, et cetera, uh, but becoming more autocratic. So uh, I ended up in this very rich part of the world with a, an amazing history and realized that uh, when I was teaching 75% uh, Islamic women at uh, university, wanting to be educated in both in critical thinking and in civics. So there's Bethlehem University. It's surrounded by settlements. Their parents have to work in them uh, for low wages. They used to own those, uh, that land. Uh, it's a totally different situation. But they want to get up that ladder of education. And uh, I was just amazed at um, the motivation of uh, these students. Uh, all of them serious minded. Uh, it broke most of my prejudices, uh, the remaining ones anyway, about um, people in that part of the world and, you know, lacking leadership, um, failing through, uh, you know, lack of compromise, all those things that we hear so often. Uh, the first year I was there, the year before, I was on an archaeological dig. I was staying with Americans in Nazareth, and I didn't really get to see much. Uh, I was there for the summer, 
uh, I, I had all the access the Americans did and I was with Israelis as well. Um, but when I went back, this was the reality down the road from the university. You know, this was the, um, so I lived in the middle of Bethlehem and I started to get to know uh, the thirst of people for knowledge. Also, just before I went, I was taken to Hebron, uh, to the mosque where there was a massacre in uh, 1997, I think it was, uh, which had, you know, an Israeli had burst in there and uh, I don't know whether you remember it. It made me realize, um, you know, just how horrific it was. And then I came back to New Zealand and there was one in New Zealand uh, last March. So um, I was asked to go down and give a talk and um, I ended up, you know, starting with uh, education. Why uh, I'm going to cut this short uh, is that why I was interested in Peter's one is that in my province here, I live uh, halfway down the east coast of the North Island, there is a uh, rocket, New Zealand now is the um, ninth country in the world uh, to be to have a rocket program. And we launch uh, rockets, electron rocket, rockets, uh, sustainable ones regularly. So um, Peter Beck, the CEO Oh, I emailed him and say, why don't you um, offer this to Somalia? Why don't you um, offer a bit of uh, cheap um, satellite coverage to someone that really needs it rather than the American military? Of course, they're funded now a lot by the Americans. And so I, I didn't get a reply, but um, no surprise there. But um, I came back and also having talked at Swinburne, I wrote an article in the national paper and local papers um, about talking about how we, we could get, five years ago, we wouldn't have thought this possible, but we could get democracy and citizenship if you had a mobile phone and satellite uh, coverage. And so um, I thought, why not? Why shouldn't I speak about that? So listening to Peter, I think, you know, surely it's possible if we've got this program this education program, to get um, funds to translate it into accessible language, to animate it, and to get some program, even in the absence. Why wait for fiber? Why wait even for a submarine? Why not um, you know, get something which is going to work for the people, uh, even in the most inaccessible places like, like New Zealand, for example? <laughs> um, I'm able to do this. Um, why shouldn't we? So when I came back, um, I was pleased to see that the country really uh, started to be much more inclusive and examine, you know, just how this could have happened. Okay, it was an Australian who'd been here for two years, but um, it had been a failure of security. Um, and it was great to see uh, even in Melbourne, um, you know, a silo in Melbourne has got this um, painting rather than a hologram. Um, of leaders who are able to make such a huge difference. And in the town next door, Hastings, uh, 20 k's away, um, someone had painted this, which um, showing Maori and uh, Islamic uh, affiliate rather than phobia uh, on the side of the library, which um, is part of it as well. And last week, um, uh, a Eritrean um, became a MP and gave his first speech to parliament. Um, saying how um, he wanted to uh, make a difference. Uh, when I was on the West Bank, Arafat is still revered for what he did do and what he didn't do and the, uh, you know, all the negotiations, all that pressure on him to compromise uh, human rights and uh, you know, compensation or right of return, um, they still revere him. So um, I think we in the West are starting to realize that democracy needs a lot more than um, just taking for granted. Uh, we need to make uh, it accessible. We need to make uh, education and civics, um, uh, I think, compulsory uh, so that people have the ability to participate. In Australia, it's compulsory to vote. In New Zealand, it's compulsory to register to vote because we think um, the disaffected, um, it's, it's, it's good to measure the amount of people who are disaffected. But um, increasingly, I'm realizing or um, think that maybe the Australians are right. Um, uh, this is something which I added just as an Australian cartoon, which I thought <laughs> summed it up for me, which way are we going to go um, and uh, who are we going to have as influencers? So that was it, Mohammed. Um, uh, how can we make the world a better future? Um, 
I think through education. Thank you for convincing me to, to do this and to um, make it possible because uh, I still think that it could be improved and I, I would love to see money funded from a new uh, US government initiative uh, to fund it properly so it's translated. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That was Tour de Force. I, I, I really enjoyed that and I hope uh, others will agree with me. For your information, this is getting recorded and will, and as we speak, it's actually live streamed on Facebook. So I'm just looking at the numbers. A lot of people are watching, especially from the Middle East and, and, and Somalia, because that's now the time. Uh, the reason we did this morning, it was for the US. And this afternoon, the reason I wanted you and Biro and, and Dennis to come on was people back home to see you because it's different when the message comes from others, not just from Somalis, but other people who also share. Uh, yeah. So I, I really appreciate your time. This was very, very useful and it will be displayed or rebroadcasted again and again through the, the websites and so on with your permission. But what I would like now to do is uh, if you will allow me to allow people to ask you questions. And if there are any questions, please raise your hand and go ahead. While waiting for any hand, I'd like to ask you all three the same question. I guess the theme was about data and governance and all this. But really, if we were to start from somewhere, I hear you be a bit about the, the idea about the crowd crowdsourcing and, and doing that by the mobile phone, which, by the way, it's already spoken about and people are thinking about it. Steve and I, we did a lot of this stuff on the School of Government, and today Dennis gave us concrete examples on what data can do or what we can do with data. So perhaps if each one of you want to just say, if it was a green field, place like Somalia, where data collection is almost non-existent, where will you start? It's really just an open question, but just your thoughts. So let's start with, it doesn't really matter. Let's start with Dennis. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I think, Mohammed, you need someone with, with, with an academic intellectual uh, understanding of the role of data and the methodologies around it. Um, a statistician of some sort, uh, somebody they don't have to have a, don't have to be a world expert, but but they've, they've got to got to have understand the basics. I think that if if there's no locus, uh, sustainable locus within a system, data is only going to be episodic. Or, or once off, which is which can be good, but 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 the value lies in the, the time series in looking at differences in uh, gathering over time. So you need that that locus of expertise, and that's got to be embedded in a in a in a political system that's going to going to fund it basically. Give them a desk and a telephone and authority to talk to others. Um, this is recognised by World Bank, UNDP, etc. It would be one of the most basic elements of infrastructure that they would fund. But uh, but it, that, that would be an important first step, I think. You're muted, Mohammed. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. Do, do you want to go, Peter, first? Your call. Yes, please. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Data collection is, um, yeah, there's, um, of course, huge challenges in 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 a place like Somalia where. Uh, you know, starting with uh, with the insecurity in the country, you know, uh, restricting you know movements of people who might be out in the field um, uh, wanting to collect uh, data. You know, it starts there. The, the challenges are just um, enormous. 
And then what, as I mentioned, what, what we've experienced on in this study that I talked about and also previous ones, um, you know, just the unwillingness um, for various reasons of, of, the, of the relevant players, the, the sources of the information you're after, uh, to disclose it. And, you know, and, and the lack of, of regulation and legislation and regulation uh, compelling them to do so. You know, it's, um, so really the, the, the challenges are enormous to, you know, to, to collect meaningful, comprehensive uh, data uh, in a country like that, and that, that's why that's why you know, I'm suggesting with with uh, this aspect here, the mobile network coverage, you uh, you know in a case like that, you really just have to go out and, and do it yourself. Um, crowdsourcing uh, could be a good option in this case, or you will remember Mohammed what we did a few years ago when we were after the information of radio spectrum use uh, <laughs> in the country. Uh, which again, the the uh, operators weren't willing to disclose. You know um, what, w w which parts of the radio of the spectrum are you uh, using? Um, so we can start coordinating it um, and so on. And of course, they were not interested to talk about that because um, as everybody knows um, in, in every other properly regulated market, um, significant amounts of money is paid for the spectrum rights, you know, to use this spectrum. So, um, you know, they, they were not keen on, on <laughs> entering discussions on that. And so what, what we did uh, was we then, uh, you know, um, in the face of, of non-cooperation from the industry, we uh, launched a project. Uh, this is when Mohammed was the minister. And we got funding from the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, to procure some equipment did some modifications, some special software, and we then went and tested it ourselves. And, and we, for the first time, we were able to, um, to show, uh, you know, um, which, which operator uses which part of the spectrum exactly. And there were some interesting findings in that, that we saw um, how the spectrum is indeed not used as efficiently as it could be, you know, with the industry self-regulating, and not oversight by an independent regulator as it as it should be. You know there was there were certainly weaknesses in in the system that they were running themselves self regulating themselves ineffective use of the spectrum some interference of different comp different operators using the same spectrum overlapping and interfering with each other. So uh, we found that, but it. You know, it, it took us, you know, making that effort and going out ourselves and and and, and testing for ourselves, um, because uh, you know, as I said, we 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 you you can't always rely on the cooperation of the players uh, to provide you with that information. Yeah. So the, yeah, well, the yeah. Are enormous. yeah. Thanks, thanks, Peter. But I just want to just uh, just ask a supplementary question. Uh, in the presentation from uh, Steve, he mentioned the, the Google Loom project. That was uh, last year. But you and I, I'm sure you remember, we were involved in this many, many years ago. But then wrestling, something else came up. So do you want to just say a few words so that other people would know where we are with that since then things have moved on? So can you please just remind us where we are now? With, uh, with uh, oh, Steve. Loom. Yeah, no, 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 uh, yeah, no, no, okay, for, so, for Peter, so Peter yeah, yeah, the Loom project, Peter, yeah. Oh, me, about the Loom yeah. project? Yeah. Yes, yes, so the interesting um, recent development is that um, uh, Google is trialing, or actually more than trialing now, but they, they ran a trial in Kenya, uh, just next door. And um, I think it's now actually a commercial service, at least on a trial basis. Um, that they have some of these balloons um, stationed over Kenya, providing LTE, 4G LTE coverage to some remote parts of Kenya uh, where there is no terrestrial uh, infrastructure. And um, yeah, we were talking to Google um, about you know, the possibility of perhaps um, uh, with this trial next door in Kenya, um, uh, what are the options for extending that across the border to Somalia using some of the existing ground infrastructure that they have on the ground in, 
in uh, Kenya. And that is a possibility, at least uh, parts of Somalia could be reached um, using that existing ground infrastructure. So um, things are moving slowly, but I, I think we'll continue talking to them and, and, and see if, if maybe we can, we can organize a, a trial and uh, maybe team them up with one of the local operators to, because that, I mean, if, if any country is, um, needs that sort of solution, it's Somalia, like, like we said, you know, many parts of the country simply don't have the terrestrial infrastructure um, for these services because of the, the insecurity and the remoteness, but <laughs> even starting with the, with the insecurity. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, solution out of the sky is perfect you know um, we'll, yeah. we'll continue <laughs> working on that yeah thanks for that i just wanted to bring that up uh, because uh, steve and i also spoke about this but way way back when google started this uh, Peter and i were in touch with them and i actually met them in the states and now they're getting closer now they're over kenya so hopefully the next move might be to Somalia. So as you can see, we never give up. We just keep on pushing and maybe one day we'll get there. Now, over to you, Steve, if you want to just tell us what would you recommend? Well, I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to ask Peter and uh, Dennis, you know, obviously data for good decision-making uh, and nuanced, you know, refined decision-making is very important. But do you think the regulation, the self-regulation is it seems to me almost impossible in a place like Somalia in the present circumstances. Is it naive to think that, um, you know, even talk about competition between uh, players reducing the, the costs is, is another solution. You're not going to use the word nationalization, but obviously, you know, the six telco companies when I was there in 2014, or at least in the UAE uh, and wrote an article on it, Obviously, they had gone in and sort of taken over and, had, uh, and really were a cartel of kinds. Uh, so the absence of competition, you know, it's, it's just absent. So is, have you sort of, are you still clinging to the old idea that, you know, somehow it's going to come right um, eventually or when their security uh, gets better? Or can you see another solution, you know, in the short term that might, uh, either get them to produce data which uh, about coverage uh, without having to, you know, go, um, uh, you know, round roundabout means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's it's, 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 it's an interesting question, <laughs> Dennis. But I'll also allow other people to to contribute. But with you, if you remember way way back when in Dubai you wrote that article, that was the beginning of a kind of a revolution for the first time. People realized whether we want to call it monopoly or whatever word we want to use, the status of the Somali telecos and, and what was happening, not only the telecos, but also the mobile money and all those other issues. We came a long way. That started the discussion and people realized we cannot hide these things anymore. And there was open discussion. So it was a step forward. Then when I joined the government myself, I got bitter <laughs> and I, I still feel nervous when I remember that, but I managed to get bitter to come to Mogadishu and actually stay at the airport and do uh, analysis on the Somali spectrum to actually find out who was using the spectrum. That was again, another step forward. And then we realized who was using the spectrum. We all know for, and I'm saying this now for the record, uh, Somali spectrum is almost free, it's unheard of. Nobody pays for the Somali spectrum, although now, the telcos pay some money, but not what they should be paying. Again, that was a step forward and we came a long way. And then with the involvement at the Swinburne University and all the work we're doing, and also with the Melbourne University, Deakin and Monash University, but mainly the last few years with the Swinburne University, we took a few more steps forward where we're engaging people who are working on the ID cards, uh, the FBNs who are working on the education, the remittance and so on. So <clears throat> slowly, slowly, we're building momentum. Basically, we're gaining more friends. We're getting more collaboration and so on. We still got a long way to go, but we are nearly there. Even, even the last few weeks here, we're getting some exposure in the media about the bank the risking and what have you. So there are lots of variables, but if you just remain within the data and the value of data and what have you, the reason this year we're calling it the digital citizenry 
it's, that's an area whereby maybe there are some low lying fruits. Maybe there are a few things we can do quickly. Uh, in fact, this morning there was some discussion about aiming for from January next year, uh, registering death and birth. You might wonder, <laughs> that's like given if you're in Australia or New Zealand, someone goes to hospital and of course record has happened by default. But not, not, but not quite so in some countries. So, and the, the issue was a Somali coming to Australia, they might not know, and that is not uh, exaggeration, but they might not know their date of birth. Why? Because it wasn't recorded. But this is not really rocket science. You don't even need a lot of technology or a lot of money to capture mm -hmm. data like that. So these are the challenges we're facing and hopefully next year we'll start that now. From there, hopefully we can build on that and we'll move forward. But I don't want to just look at the negative side, but also there are a lot of positive things happening. There are a lot of issues uh, that are getting resolved. But yes, there's still too many other issues. I'll, I'll allow other people to ask questions. Welcome, Ball. Ball is back. So, <laughs> um, so maybe maybe it does involve rocket science as well, Mohammed. <laughs> no, no, well, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. But but uh, I still remain optimistic. I think. From where we started, I think we came a long way, but of course, there's heaps more to do. And the people who will be watching this video, I just want to leave the message with them that basically it's doable. It can be done, but uh, it just needs a lot more collaboration and a lot more people thinking along the same lines. So I'll allow other people to ask questions or comments. Are there any other questions, comments? I don't see any. Uh, Mohammed, I'll yeah. just comment comment that uh, I, mean, I, I don't know Somalia at, at all well but uh, I've, you and I have spoken many times and I, I've, I've read quite a bit so I, I've got some sense um, there, there are almost always steps that can be taken I mean one that comes to mind with, without having researched it at all is the, the amount of data that's held on Somalia by the international agencies. Now, it would be, their, their data sets would be incomplete in almost all areas, but ne nevertheless, there, there would be a substantial amount of data uh, over many decades in, in the, the World Bank, the IMF, the UNDP, the specialized agencies. And um, even just to make that accessible and available to the Somali government, you know, in a, a statistics office. Mm. That's, that's a pretty basic step, mm. but it, it, it's quite doable. On the, 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 the um, registration of births, deaths, you were talking about before, that's one of the projects under the Indigenous Wellbeing mm. umbrella in Australia because of the, the, the positive effect that it has, the, the, the uh, the way that it can enhance people's life chances in, in area of health, of education, uh, interaction with the rest of the world, we come thinking passports and the rest of it, uh, increasing international confidence in the passport system because there's underlying data underlying the issuing of the passports. Um, th that's um, that, that's a, a value to individuals and to the society over time. And a start can be made. It, it wouldn't be, I can see it, it might only be comprehensive in small parts of the country, but you start building the data infrastructure, you start building the, uh, <clears throat> the, the integrity of systems for issuing cards and the rest of it, you start being able to extract information from the system to inform health agencies, education agencies. Uh, that, that doesn't require universal peace. It's uh, obviously much, much easier. The, the more, uh, especially if especially if firms are seeing their advantage for themselves. You know, as Peter was yeah. saying, uh, you know, they don't share it because they're fearful. But if that fear